Lancaster's on board. Better dial him in. Oh. Hi, Lancaster. Don't forget to ask at least one question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And Dennis will try not to hang up on you again. Yes. So I just want to, I, just so we know who we are um, and who the audience is, how many people as attorneys have a guardian ad litem appointed for, um, have a guardian ad litem on the case that was appointed for their client? In the past? In the past. How yes, many have yes, had that yes, happen? Yes, yes. Great. How many people sitting in the room uh, have actually been a guardian ad litem? Ah, okay, great. And Lancaster? Okay. All right, so um, has anyone ever had to fight either county council, minors council, or another legal to prevent a guardian litem, ad litem from being um, uh, put into place? Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, all right, let's, let's and, begin. And were you successful in that fight? Yes. 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 Were you successful? Yes. yes. All of you? Yes. Nice. Well, not, not in Lancaster. Not in Lancaster, okay. No surprise. <laughs> no surprise. <laughs> oh, oh yes. you said yes. Oh, even in Lancaster, then, would be the answer. All right. All right, great. I'm going to turn it over to Jessica Jorgensen now. So I'm not going to read this whole quote, and we didn't provide you this in your materials, but I'm happy to provide it to anybody who wants it afterwards, and I believe it will be up on the drive. It's just we're going to be going through some hypotheticals, and we didn't want any cheating. So... <laughs> Um, but I'm just going to read a part of this because it kind of frames the conversation we're going to be having today. Many a man has prosecuted a lawsuit to his detriment or ruin. His ordinary caution and good judgment warped by prejudice, spite, or a stubborn purpose to vindicate, quote, the principle of the thing. His attorneys in the court may have been entirely convinced that he was blindly and contumaciously re refusing to settle his case upon terms that were obviously advantageous to him and they may have been right. Does this sound like a client that any of you have ever had? No. Yes, yes. Does this sound like you in any circumstance when you've been either representing a client or pursuing your own passion? Yeah. So all of us have been here or done that at one point or another. All of us have represented this client before. The quote goes on to talk about you know, what would be the best definition of incompetency? What makes a person unable to handle their own affairs? And why is this so important in our cases? Um, and what we're really going to see as we go through these hypotheticals is that each of these cases is fact specific. There's no way for us to give you one answer to, yes, a GAL should be appointed in every case like this. No, a GAL should never be appointed for a client. There is no yes or no, there is no clear answer. It depends on the facts of your case, and we're going to have to go through that point by point. So we're hoping to give you a couple of examples of where to go from that. And if you have any questions or hypotheticals of your own, we can maybe um, take those at the end. Um, so, oh, one, one more point is that Crazy does not equal incompetence. So this is not just somebody who's exhibiting strange, bizarre, paranoid behavior, a diagnosis of mental health, as you all should know, I sure hope, is not a diagnosis of incompetence. Has anyone asked for a guardian ad litem or allowed a guardian ad litem to be uh, imposed without uh, an argument because it would just be easier for you? Okay, so everybody can go. Because <laughs> that's the bottom line. That's what I am afraid happens too often. And I think that it can also happen to good people um, who are trying to do their very best under certain circumstances. So just always ask yourself, whenever the guardian ad litem issue um, comes up, always ask yourself, you know, is this a prejudice that I have? Are, I, are any of my biases at play? And eliminate those. And I'm sure a reason why a number of you are here today is because this is an ethics MCLE and who does not want their ethics special credits? So let's talk about how this in particular ties into that. Um, the duty of competency in California Rules of Professional Conduct talks about how an attorney should, um, the rule of competence means the learning and skill 
They need to apply the learning and skill necessary for the performance of any such service. What does that mean in this context? It means that it's important that in being able to assess whether a client needs a guardian at litem and being able to assess the underlying issues in these cases, you need to have a baseline understanding of mental health. And you need to have a baseline understanding of what the various conditions are, how they can present potentially with their um, symptoms and behaviors. Um, and how changeable they are. How just because someone is presenting in a certain way today does not mean they're going to present in a certain way tomorrow. It doesn't mean the medication. We just had a case where we told the client, you know what, we're just going to do an emergency detention today. We're going to send you home and please come back tomorrow. We had already cleared it with the support group. Um, please come back tomorrow and let's interview you before you take your meds and bring your meds with you so you can take them right away. But let's talk to you before you take your meds. And it made all the difference in the world. It took a client who was basically comatose to a client who was able to answer all of the questions to do all of the paperwork. Yeah, and just knowing that if bipolar is the person's condition, maybe talking to them in the midst of a manic episode is not going to be the time when you're going to be able to get the information you need and have a productive conversation. So time is very important. And in past, we've referenced you to the NAMI um, National Alliance. Uh, no, National Association, no, National of, Association Mental of Mental Illness. Illness. Yeah. Um, fact sheets, that's a great place to go. I know they Dennis. are. They give you all the symptoms. Um, everybody who was at the training earlier or last week um, <laughs> got copies of it all. But you can go online to the NAMI website. It tells you all the symptoms. It tells you the treatments. It tells you what medications. You know, sometimes you can work backwards. Sometimes your client doesn't know that they have any mental illness, but they can tell you the name of the medication that they're taking. So with that frame of reference in mind, hypothetical number one. <laughs> um, I guess I'll read it for anybody who can't see it and for Lancaster. Um, you have been asked to represent mother. She just had a successful Marsden hearing with another ladle and you are up next in the rotation. All you know is that this client has a reputation that precedes her as being, quote, very difficult, uh, end quote. The petition concerns mental health. So our first questions to you are, do you accept that appointment? Um, and is there anything you would want to know or do before accepting the appointment? And before we get into your answers. So first of all, how does this parent have a reputation as being very difficult? Unfortunately, nine times out of ten, it's because the lawyer talking about the client comes in and says, oh my God, I have another crazy client, or I have another crazy detention, or oh no, she's crazy. What's the problem with saying that? What, what's that? <laughs> Confidentiality. What else? It stigmatizes the parent. What else? More fundamentally. Having to do with your state bar license. Loyalty. It's unethical. Yes. Yes, it is unethical. You cannot, you have just tried and convicted or sustained allegations against your client in the attorney room. Because now it's going to be, you know, talked about openly. This is one of the biggest problems that we have in this courthouse. Um, is that the cases often get uh, litigated in the ante room. And that's, that, that, that might be, I'll give you that that might be appropriate on some occasions. But not with stuff like this. We cannot be calling our clients' names or be stigma, but stigmatizing our clients in the ante room. Please, the crazier your client is, the more you should be, you know, sewing your lips shut. And we recognize that these are some of the most difficult cases because oftentimes you feel ill-equipped to deal with the person that is in front of you and the um, barrage of complaints or um, concerns that are being thrown at you. But that's why the second part of your duty of competence and that making sure that you have the mental, emotional, and physical ability reasonably necessary for the performance of your service is taking care of yourself and finding the right outlet for those concerns and information. If you need to, you can vent to a supervisor within your firm. You can go back to the office and vent, oh my gosh, you'll never believe what happened today in court. I had this margin and I just had to sit there silently while this crazy woman ranted on and on about X, Y, Z. But it's not in the ante room and it's not with your fellow um, attorneys and it's not in open court, it's not with the bailiff, it's not in front of the judge, it's not, not in front of the judge. It's, 
only within your firm. So we're both on the same page with Absolutely. the concern Absolutely. over that. So with a client like this where you, you know someone has, say it's in the detention report, that there's mental health issues going on, then you know to take extra care with your demeanor, take extra care with the warmth of your greeting, with your smile, with your, your creation of a safe place. Because oftentimes, I can't tell you how many times I've had a client, um, I've read a report, the client sounds totally, you know, totally, you know, just impossible. And then I go out and I talk to them and I'm respectful and I'm kind and I'm gentle, and, or at least I'm trying to be those things. And they respond. And, I, and then I can walk back in the attorney room and then I can say something like, you know, I don't know what this report is talking about. You know, my client seems great. You know, and you can say that to Myers Counsel. You might even want to introduce Myers Counsel to your client if, if the difference really is a night and day between what it looks like in the report and what your client um, uh, is saying, you know, outside in the, in the lobby. I've had that happen on many occasions. I just recently had a very young woman who apparently was comatose with the department or catatonic with the department. I don't know. I wasn't there. But when she came here, she just opened up more and more steadily. And by the time I had her smiling and laughing, I brought over Miners Council to see. And Miners Council went from a hard no to a hard yes in returning to mom. So with this fax set that we've given you, Bailiff calls you in and says, ladle, whatever, you're up next, the court's appointing you on this case. Are you accepting that appointment with what you have in front of you? How many of you say yes? How many of you say no? Any brave souls in here? <laughs> okay, so let's talk about a couple of fundamentals. Number one, only the judge appoints or relieves counsel. Please remember that just always. It, it comes up in lots of different areas. Only the judge can, can appoint or relieve counsel. When a private attorney calls you up and says, you know, I can't represent this client anymore, um, I'm, I'm just going to ask to be relieved, you know, will you, uh, will you just let the judge know you can take the case? Yeah, no. No, right? Everybody agrees that's a no. Okay. All right. Um, so, do you want to throw something in there? You keep going on? Okay. Your, your Honor, I'm a roll. So um, only the judge appoints and relieves. You are not appointed until the judge therefore appoints you. So we, 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 get, we play fast and loose with our language in the courtroom, but I am available for appointment until I have been appointed. I am available for appointment until there's been a conflict that I've, I've figured out. Now I'm no longer available for appointment. We're going to have to move to the next person on the list. It should be as simple as that. Does anybody have any questions about how that would actually work in court? Do you get it? It's just a paradigm shift? Are you all going to be able to do that? I'm seeing, here's what I'm seeing from up here. I'm seeing faces that look like... <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let's explain why, maybe. Okay. So while you may be available for appointment on this case, looking at what you have before you, I think it's very important that before you accept the appointment for that case, you have a client present in court, you need to have a conversation with that person. Do you know if you can actually establish an attorney-client relationship with that individual? Do you know if this is an issue of competency that resulted in the, um, that may have resulted in the ultimate Marsden on this case? Or was it just a personality conflict or, you know, difference in agreement or breakdown in communication as we like to say? on this case. So it's important that you go out there, as Dennis said, and you approach that person with what, anybody who's gone to a training of Dennis's knows what he says the first thing you should always start every... With a smile. <laughs> with a smile. <laughs> um, start with a smile, but figure out if you can actually form this attorney-client relationship with that individual. If you cannot <coughs> form an attorney-client relationship with that individual, then that might be the point when you need to advise the court accordingly. As a, in, in line with our policy that we um, created with uh, Ken's <laughs> final say and approval, if you cannot form the attorney-client relationship, then you need to let the court know, I am not able to accept appointment in this matter because I'm unable to form an attorney-client relationship. And that you need to know 
may trigger the GAL inquiry for that client, may and should um, for the court trigger a GAL inquiry for that client. So before you get to that step, all the other steps need to be taken, um, but it has to happen with a conversation that you've had with that client. You can't do that looking at paper and just hearing from somebody, hey, you're up, take this client, she's right. tough. Yes. In our court, what happens is we have a list. So we go down the list right. and they'll say, Donna, you're next up. So the bailiff will usually say, or I'll make them, you know, there's a lot of us that will put it in order and we'll see a case comes in, who's next, and you take the thought, you know, you take the case, you start looking at it and you go out. And but you write your name in before we, or after well, you do the conflict normally check. Normally, what we'll do is that if I'm picking up, so my, my um, number will go by ladle three. So it's like I'm to pick it up. Now, I haven't been appointed until I'm appointed by the court. Mm -hmm. And there is some times that you go out and you say, oh, my God, why was I next? Nobody's mm -hmm. else has spoken. And I represented a lot of crazies. I find people that have challenges like I do. But the question is I find it more <laughs> challenging and more interesting because then you're really stepping in as an attorney and you have to wait to deal. I mean, look, a lot of us, if you make it that easy, you go out and I can't see the form of relationship because sometimes, especially, you get certain people that are in your face, they don't want to listen, they're angry, this and that. You can't just go back and say, well, I don't want to represent because I can't form a bond. But I think the... <coughs> can get a sense, I mean, if a person has a mental health, a lot of times they just allege mental health for reasons that are not mental health. Sometimes you go out, because we tell with a couple together, it's very, very difficult, and I... Um, I have come this close to Marsden and Donna. <laughs> As it a went out many times, and I took you out many times on the field. Um, so, so Donna, we've known each other for 50 years, so it doesn't matter. 50? So <laughs> Let me know. I think that what would help here is if you just all remember, I think you're a little bit worried about saying something to a judge that the judge isn't going to want to hear. So let me just tell you this. You get, you get complete cover if you just say, Your Honor, I'm not available for appointment yet because I haven't done my conflict check. Now, in fact, and you say, et cetera. You know, there's a lot of things that we each have to do before we can accept a client uh, for appointment. But if, right, I, can I, if I couldn't take something or there's a conflict, then I just go to the next person. Exactly. Want, you can't make it so easy and let yeah, everybody no, Donna, feel, hold on. this is a difficult case. We don't go before the judge until that person... Can you hold judge. on, though? You're jumping way ahead in the training. Marlene, all I, let's all let Marlene okay. talk. <laughs> what I'd like you to address, which I think might be um, difficult, is... You're right, we don't get appointed until the court appoints us, but somewhere people are on the pickup list and you know there's a person outside. And you go outside to begin having that discussion with a prospective client, you've done your conflicts check and everything. So when you have a person who is not having a regular discourse with you, what does forming an attorney-client relationship look like? That's what I was saying. And how do you determine when you then go into the judge and say, I'm having a problem of forming an attorney-client relationship, whatever it is. Right, so for Lancaster, Donna, let us answer your question. I promise we're going to get to it, okay? For Lancaster, essentially the issue is in finding out what does it actually mean to establish an attorney-client relationship. All I was meaning to tell you guys is what is the potential problem with accepting appointment, with being appointed on a case without having talked to that person at all. The ultimate problem might be that you are not able to actually form an attorney-client relationship with that person because they need a GAL and now you're on a case with somebody who needs a GAL and you are in a difficult ethical position of not being able to um, to conflict with your duty of loyalty to a client, your duty of confidentiality, and your duties of competency all come at, to a head in that situation where you're on a case and you fully believe a client needs a GAL, but what we have decided in our analysis of the rules and in consultation with Ken is that it should never be our job to request that GAL for the client. So all I'm letting you know is that is what we're trying to avoid before you accept an appointment with somebody um, that may or may not be incompetent. And we're going to go through exactly what <coughs> defines competency, what steps you should take before you bring this matter to the court and say, nope, I'm out, I can't do this, I can't form the attorney-client relationship. But that's the ultimate end that we're trying to avoid, is being stuck on a case where you can't actually represent the client effectively 
um, in your duties as an attorney. So you're specific to GAL because when you made that broad statement, it was like you got a client and you know we're not building the rapport. And a lot of times with people that are not susceptible to GAL, it takes a little bit of time because they're angry when they come in, and that's when you have to read. And I talk a lot. I talk that I have to so, slow myself down, try to smile, try to say I understand what you're going through. Let's calm down. Here's this, this, and that. That's different than when you know when you go in there, and pretty much you can start telling that there may be an issue. But as Dennis said, you because I have a judge that sometimes will want to do it, and I'd have to sit there and find. Her. I am not requesting. I don't think it's. A necessity, I'm able, she knows why she's in court, she knows this, she knows that, she can help me with it, I don't want it, and in that one of the cases we had, she still wanted it, we had numerous hearings there, we had one, and then we tried to get rid of it. I got right. a GAL, and then at trial, the judge knew, in another court, that she was totally intelligent, she understood everything, and we got rid of the GAL, but you're being specific to GAL, not just a client that's difficult, or doesn't want to talk, it's someone that has these issues that could be susceptible to a GAL. Right. That's when you said the statement by saying what you talked about. So that's why we framed this entire training with right. the idea that we're not talking about the difficult, obstinate, run-of-the-mill client who you just don't want to deal with and who's really just putting up a fight at every end. We're talking about <coughs> issues of actually being able to communicate in the basis of most basic of levels with a client. And we have six hypotheticals to yeah, go through so that are going to take you one. through every yeah. aspect of it, I promise. Yeah. Um, and just, just to finish this up, some of the things that I want to know in order to make sure that I, before I accept an appointment is going through, reading the reports carefully for details relevant to the representation so that you can make an informed decision about that. Because there's, there's often a door, there's often more than one, but there's usually at least one doorway into the client. And, and you just have to find the right key. So if you've read the report, usually the key is in there somewhere. It might be buried, it might be difficult to find, but read the report. Knowing the facts of, of the potential client's life are going to make the client feel confident and comfortable in you representing them. If you get w even one fact wrong, has anybody had that situation where they just got one fact wrong? They said your son instead of your daughter, and the client just goes off, so you don't even know if I have a son or a daughter! How can you be representing me? Right? Yeah, and they're kind of right. Like, oh my god, I'm so sorry. So. You and know. your client just requested and received, your potential client just requested and received a new attorney. Why? Don't you want to know from them why? Because you're not talking with their, their former attorney about that. So why did that just happen? What is from their perspective? What went wrong? And that will help you have an idea of what you're doing. If your client can communicate their concerns and issues, even if it's with a touch of conspiracy theory or a load of conspiracy theory, I don't care, then you are good. Okay, that's going to be the bottom line of this. If they can communicate what they want and what their issues and concerns are to you, that's going to be enough for us. So, I think we already did. We that kind of touched on this already, but Lancaster doesn't have the benefit of this. They don't have the. Do you guys have the PowerPoint, Lancaster? You do. Right. Okay. Great. Okay, well, all we said, all the second one goes on to say, you go outside the courtroom to speak with mother before accepting, sorry guys, that's how bad it is, before accepting the appointment. Mother doesn't even let you introduce yourself. She indicates that she does not need an attorney as this case is all going to go away. It's a conspiracy against her and you're a part of that conspiracy. She continues on to say that this isn't even her child and they have the wrong person. The bailiff is now calling you into the courtroom to accept the appointment. And we uh, talked about what do you do here, what ethical issues are at play, is this client competent, and what follow-up questions would you ask? I think that we've touched on all the issues of the ethical issues at play here. Um, I think that this is a good segue to discuss what is competency. To answer Donna's question and to get to the heart of Marlene's question as well, what is competency? What makes an individual competent to make their own decisions about these cases? Do you want me to go any further? Primarily, it is the ability to assist in their own defense. And if they have the ability to assist in their own defense, then you do not have a guardian ad litem situation. Um, just to give you a couple of scenarios, I don't see Lossero here, but 
um, uh, one of our attorneys had a client who had encephalitis and uh, it was causing severe brain damage and she had no short-term memory. She had long-term memory, but no short-term memory. What that meant in reality was every time, oh, and she lived in Mexico. So every time Lasso called her in Mexico, he had to tell her anew that he was her lawyer, that her daughter had been detained in the United States, and explain everything that had happened. Each time he did that, she came up with the exact same answer about what the situation was for her daughter, what she wanted for her daughter, how she wanted this case to go, what she wanted him to do, and what she didn't want him to do. Furthermore, she lived in, in a, with a family in Mexico, and the family was her support system, and Lasser was also able to talk to them, and they confirmed that, yes, everything she's told you is correct, accurate, there's nothing wrong with what she's um, wanting or remembering. She just can't remember anything that happened recently. Um, so in that case, the department, um, when they ran into the problem, their knee-jerk reaction was to get a guardian ad litem appointed, and they went to court and, and asked the judge to appoint a guardian ad litem. Lasso um, aggressively fought that. Um, the mother, you know, he prepared the mother, and the mother testified on the phone. And in fact, no guardian ad litem was appointed because that is not the purpose of a guardian ad litem. Based on this initial or the subsequent fact pattern, does anybody see any initial issues that need to be discussed in the determining the representation of this client, whether she wants you as her attorney or not? Anyone? Yeah? Well, if she won't talk to you, you say, look, I can't take this case. I, I don't even, I gave her the report. I asked her to read it and she cussed me out or, you know, shoot me off as a lot, but I can't take the case. So she Because I can't even talk to her. Right. She won't I, talk to you and she says she doesn't need an attorney. She's going in for her. Right, so let's talk to this client about whether or not she actually wants a court-appointed attorney. Maybe this starts off with a Faretta waiver discussion, all right? There's a lot of, these cases often involve a lot of interlap, overlapping issues. So under these circumstances, you might want to dig a little deeper and understand, do you actually want an attorney to represent the, you in this matter or are you seeking to represent yourself? Then you have a duty at that point under your competent representation to explain to them exactly what that would mean to them to try and go in pro per and how that may negatively impact their case given the um, niche area of law that dependency is and that, that it's very rare that courts are going to allow parties to go in pro per. They don't have the right to these proceedings and you're going to need to explain that to them. So if it's not a Faretta waiver issue, go ahead. But if that's still what they want to do, then you help them with the Faretta waiver. Um, you can't help them fill it out because the purpose of the Freda waiver is to find out what the parent's ability is to answer all those questions. So you can't help them fill out the Freda waiver, but you can give them the Freda waiver and you can tell them, you know, give them a pen. Um, if there's a word they don't understand, you can explain that word to them. Um, and then you take it in, you file it with the court, and the judge will have a hearing and rule on the Freda waiver. Once the judge has ruled, now you've gotten that out of the way. So you may be able to talk to the client. Now the client might be willing to talk to you more. Depends on how much they perceived that you were actually trying to help them get their own attorney. You know, I usually go in and I say, Your Honor, I think this case would uh, proceed much more easily and much more quickly if the mother was allowed to represent herself because she has a defense. She understands exactly what she wants her defense uh, to be, and I think that she could do a good job of presenting it. Now, while we, I know that I might as well have kept my mouth shut because that's not going to work with the judge, that's not what my client is perceiving. My client sitting next to me is perceiving, oh, he, under, he gets me, he understands what I want, he's trying to do it. Now the judge is the bad guy, which, let's face it, on the pay scale, they should be. The buck should stop there. And, you know, so this is very important. If it's not the threat or waiver issue, you want to move on to meeting her where she is. That's Dennis's phrasing that I think is very important. And the reason I put this image up here is because it, it symbolizes a very important sort of idea that just because you you believe that you are right doesn't mean your client is wrong, okay? We could both be looking at two sides of the same problem and actually be talking in, to the same end game. So when your client says that this is all going to go away, and you're like, no, it's not. <laughs> this is definitely not going away. Well, meet her where she is. Maybe that's what she believes. Also, you can say, well, yes, I, I'm, I agree that it should go away. Let's see what we can do to make that happen. Here's what the judge is going to want to hear. Exactly. Why doesn't she think this is her child? What, what is her reasoning for that? Does it have some sort of valid 
a basis in it. Um, I was told of one situation where, in fact, Dennis said he did find somebody who was not actually the mother of a child yeah, who yeah. had come into court. So yeah. why is she saying this instead of run it, instead of saying to mom right at the outset, the no, nope, there's no way? The department has done in and outs on the wrong mother before. I mean, you, now that I say that, you go, well, of course they must have done at least wrong mother. <laughs> Does she have a child? But where? also, you can buy in. Mother could not admit that her child was her child because he was a superhero and he's a little little superhero. And as she told me, little superheroes have to be protected. They don't grow they don't come into the world as grown-up powerful superheroes. They have to be protected when they're little so that they can grow into the powerful, strong superhero. That made perfect sense to me. And I was able to completely believe her and completely support her in that. And, and we were able to, you know, get past it and move on because the villains that were trying to kill her little superhero were out there and there were indeed villains. Ultimately, I actually even got her to understand that the primary villain in the case was fear, which is a complex, um, a complex uh, metaphor for her to understand and yet she did. So she wasn't that, she was pretty bright. So in your general situation, Ask them the questions. Does she have a child? Where is her child? Where does she think her child is? What is her understanding of the case? Because it's a little bit more than just their ability to assist counsel um, to determine competency. Case law has said that it's defined as whether the parent has the capacity to understand the nature of the proceedings, which is pretty basic. Do they know why they're here? When they say to you, well, the department's alleged, blah, 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 and it's all because of conspiracy. The FBI is after me. They've implanted this in, in my brain. And blah. Okay, well, they understand. They understand why they're here. The department has filed these allegations against them that they believe are wholeheartedly untrue. And are they able to assist you in preparing the case? And that doesn't mean that we agree with their defense. It doesn't mean that we agree with their theory. It means can they help you to achieve what they want to be their goal? She says, I want my kid back. I know this shouldn't be happening. And can she at least explain to you why she believes that to be so in ways that you can pursue um, throughout the law? So, hypothetical two. Hypothetical two. You represent father. There are criminal allegations pending against the father that are interrelated with the dependency court matter. The case is on for adjudication and will continue for the father to be brought in because he was recently transferred to Patton State Hospital. The county council has requested that the court appoint a GAL for the father because of a, quote, recent finding of incompetency in the criminal court. What do you do and what should the court do? Does anybody have any thoughts? I have lots of thoughts. Else Dennis thoughts? has lots of thoughts. Really, you're all going to defer to my thoughts. <laughs> okay, well, despite what she says that it's over, and despite the fact that there's a case that says it's over, I maintain that there will be a case that will come down on our side in the future that says it's not over. Because a, a finding of incompetency in criminal court ha, is the result of a completely different strategy. It's, it's for entirely different purposes. And it has an entirely different effect than a finding of incompetency in our court. I think the two should be um, uh, distinguished and distinguishable. And I believe that sooner or later we're going to have a case that is going to you know, bring that before the appellate court. Yes, ma'am. So we had a similar case and we were going back and forth about it. Um, the question is, our client in criminal court is trying to prove incompetency, wants to be proven incompetent. Is, a is that finding, a D? A D guy? Yes. Is a finding that he's competent in dependency, will that hurt his criminal status? Well, and why does he want so much, why does he want himself to be found incompetent in his D, in his criminal case. Dennis, you have to go back to what you just said. In the criminal court, what the competency goes to is intent, to mens rea, whether a person can form mens rea of intent. In dependency, competency has to do with what you're telling us, whether the person understands the nature of the proceedings. I mean, in criminal court, you can understand possibly the nature of the proceedings, but not have the ability to form the mens rea to do the crime. We don't have to do that because we deal most of the time Marley. in the realm of negligence. Problem. So, counter argument? You're, well, you're talking about the incompetency as a verdict or as an outcome of right. the case. And I'm talking about incompetency and the ability to stand trial. 
Right. So, so that goes, the, the ability goes, it's the same issue because the ability to stand trial, even in the criminal case, still has to hit the issue of right. that, that forming of the intent. So, But oftentimes a public defender, right, correct me if I'm wrong, Oftentimes, a public defender is going to say, "Listen, if you go to, if you get convicted of this, which you're likely to, and you go to regular jail, you're going to be in serious shit. And if you, if we, as long as we have you declared incompetent to stand trial, you stay at Patton State Hospital, which you're where you are likely to be safer. And so we try to get you there as long as we can." Till when you your trial will result in a time served for the You're amount of time about the you spent the defense. Okay, I think we're getting a little astray yeah. from <laughs> what, what, what the what actual I case to though was the issue though of the difference it's between the criminal case and the defense. I'm here. He's, he's now right at the podium. The, the, and the reason why is you can't mix the apples and oranges by saying if a client is found in. If, a, if we have a GAL in dependency court, does that impact the criminal case? I don't believe it does, because it's apples and oranges, because of the different standards and why you get that kind of or want that ruling in the criminal case. And, so ultimately, and ultimately, we hope that the Court of Appeal will come down and agree with Marlene, because right now what they've said is, if you're found incompetent to stand trial in criminal court, then you have to have a guardian ad litem in dependency court. Because of right. the higher so, burden. No, that is not exactly. That wasn't the reason. If I may, that's okay. not why. There's an unpublished case directly on point to this. It's called In Re Fantasia W. It's a dependency court case. And to answer Emily's question first, would a finding, would us seeking a finding of competency in dependency court impact negatively their criminal court proceedings? That's often a question we're, we're faced with, right? Anything we do here, are we going to mess up their criminal case because that could result in, you know, far dire consequences in our mind, but maybe our clients don't see it that way because losing their kids is pretty dire. But we don't want to affect their criminal case. I don't think that it would affect their criminal case for finding incompetency here because a finding of incompetency or competency, sorry, in juvenile proceedings is very basic. It does not have the same kind of stringent requirements that a criminal court proceeding requires. If a defendant is found not to be competent in the criminal court, the court has to make specific findings and orders regarding treatment and placement of the defendant. They are required to seek um, evaluations from professionals um, that are going to be used to make that determination. And the due process um, concerns and procedure that is in play is far more stringent than ours because what you're faced with in a criminal finding of incompetency is commitment as opposed to what we feel like is commitment to losing your child forever but not actually physical commitment of your body in a locked facility where you're being given medication or treatment potentially against your will or desire. So do I think it will affect the criminal case? No. Do I think that a finding of incompetency in criminal court is going to affect our case? Yes, because what it comes down to is where the initial determination of competency was made. So in a dependency court case, if there was an initial determination of competency that was made in another proceeding, then you're faced with what the Code of Civil Procedure 372 says, that whenever a minor with exceptions for minor parents, but we won't get into that. A person who lacks legal capacity to make decisions or a person for whom a conservator has been appointed as a party, that person shall appear by a guardian or a conservator in any proceeding before the court. So the penal code that determines a parent to be incompetent to stand trial actually only requires a finding that as a result of their mental disorder or developmental disability, they're unable to understand the nature of the criminal proceedings and unable to assist in their defense. It is very similar to our standard, and that is where our standard was born out of, both the penal code and the probate code. While I understand the counter argument that we're putting forth and saying don't give up the fight because it's unpublished case law, and you can try and distinguish the purposes of a finding in criminal court versus a finding in dependency court, ultimately, we are often hamstrung when our clients have overlapping criminal cases. And that may be the problem that we have here, that they are going to be appointed to jail in our proceedings. Mm -hmm. But then, go ahead. 
Oh, sorry, just a good question. So yeah. I imagine, is there a carve out in terms of timing? Mm -hmm. Because someone, for example, could be in a comatose state at the time of the criminal proceeding and then that has changed now that they're in dependency. Well, then you would want to come in and argue that. that but, so there's no like certain. Not in any time. statute or any case law. No, not yet, but that would be the perfect argument. Mm -hmm. right. and we, would, we would love to take that up if it was denied. And so when a person is found incompetent in a criminal proceeding, a further hearing is set to review that finding of incompetency and see if the commitment and treatment and medication and or medication that they've been um, placed on is making a difference. So while you may, the court might be right to appoint the GAL for this client and you may lose that battle, you can try and fight it, but ultimately let's talk about moving forward for this client. Don't I know it feels like a death sentence, and I know that Dennis thinks it's a death sentence, but a GAL does not have to be a death sentence to your client. And you've got to think about what actions you need to take, continue to take moving forward in this case. So consider looking at the um, minute orders or when, it, when is that person coming back for a competency review in the criminal court and asking for a progress hearing to readdress the issue of the GAL shortly thereafter or at, that, at or about that time. Or do a 388 once it happens, which is probably what the court would require you to do. Because remember, any time the circumstances change, you can do a 388. You don't want to do them oftentimes during status reviews because at status review hearings, the burdens of proof are, are generally you know, more favorable to the parents. But still, for stuff like this, for these things that have changed, when circumstances change that affect visitation, when circumstances change that affect their status with a guardian ad litem, you immediately want to follow 388. And don't forget, depending on what stage of the procedure you're at or where you are, are you know other remedies? Make sure the reasonable efforts are still being put being put in this put in place in this case. If it's an FR case, make sure that that just because that person is incompetent doesn't necessarily mean that they are going to be forever and that they don't deserve to have the reasonably narrowly tailored services that are specifically designed to help them with those issues. And also think about making appropriate plans. You need to communicate with the guardian at litem who is appointed and consider what other options may be available to avoid the uh, TPR of this client's Brittany, children. Brittany, 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 Brittany. So this, just for your reference, I'll send it to you Brittany. all after if you want. But there are a number of things that can be considered in determining whether or not a guardian at litem should be appointed. One of those things is a prior judgment. Brittany! <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what are the issues? What are the issues in Brittany's case? Brittany had a general conservatorship. You do want to make sure um, which type of conservatorship it is. Assuming it's a general conservatorship, then you don't have to do anything. The general conservator is your client. You, are, you have to call that general conservator and ask them what about all the major decisions you're making in the case. You need to call them when you're filling out all the paperwork, frankly. Um, and then you might have some problems because general conservators, like Brittany, had her dad, has her dad, still has her dad today. So, you know, Brittany just talks to her dad, her dad talks to the lawyer, it's all, it works real nice. But a lot of people who have conservators have the public guardian? Public guardian. Public guardian. The public guardians, I don't know, I don't know. I mean, they are sometimes very difficult to deal with. Dennis, they can't hear you. Okay. Um, the public guardian can be sometimes very difficult to deal with. They don't want to come to court. I've had to subpoena them usually when I need them in court. Um, when they get to court, they don't really want to answer your questions. Um, but, you know, they are, they are the client, they need to be there, you need to consult with them, and, um, you know, if they don't return your phone small calls, correction. if they don't return your phone calls or come, you just subpoena them. Yes, ma'am? I think it's a small point of distinction, but the guardian at litem is not the client, just FYI. I'm, I always say that, <laughs> yeah, and that's, we use those words a lot, but she's right. Yeah, they're not a party to the case. They don't become a party. They just have a limited ministerial role to assist in the direction of the case. Your client still remains your client. You just have to take ultimate direction from the guardian ad litem. Right. Just so people understand that distinction. Yes. When well, you're asking for them, uh, first of all, could you ask uh, the court to order there was them back? No. And if, if not, mm. is the only way to get them to court if they don't want to is to subpoena them? Pretty much. Okay, so the question was, when you're asking for the public guardian to be present, can you ask for them to be ordered back? Is right, if they're present at the hearing, can you make a request to the court, or is the only avenue to get Oh, them? if they're present at a hearing, 
you can, you know, just whip out a subpoena right then and have them served and have the court order them back. But rely on the subpoena. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Are you going to address our duties when we get appointed as a GAL? Yes. Great. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'm a little confused about what Jessica said. If you're wait, going we're coming to you next. The, no, wait, Lancaster has a question or repeat the question? No, they have a question. Oh, okay. So, if the guardian ad litem is only supposed to act in a ministerial capacity and ultimately we have to take direction from that person, I, I don't understand. If our client is saying, like, okay, I want my kid back, but we're at a point where there is a guardian ad litem, and we're like at a 2 2 and the rec is to TFR, and the guardian ad litem is just saying, like, I'll just submit on the TFR rec. Okay, so, I repeat the question. Yeah, so that back. question is what do you do when the guardian ad litem is saying, submit on the TFR rec, and um, the client is saying, but I want my kid back, I want my kid back? So, this is kind of complicated in this segues, I think, really nicely into the GAL's duties and powers. And when we are GALs, it's important to know that you, as the GAL, are supposed to be communicating with the client um, and determining what it is their, their um, interests and desires are. And your actions that you take are supposed to be aligned with their interests and desires and also their best interests and desires. But you're not supposed to supplement your judgment or your beliefs in place for them. You're supposed to be sort of making decisions on their behalf. So. I, I don't think that, I can't say on any circumstances, but with the limited facts you've given me, for a client who says, I want my kid back, I would never as a GAL just say, okay, just submit on the TFR rec. Um, you may not have a legal argument to make for it, but that's often what happens for our clients. I would say, your client wants to continue FR, please object to the court's termination of, making, uh, of doing this. I don't have any further information to support a legal argument to that effect, but I need you to place an objection on the record, is what I would probably do as a GAL under those circumstances. The distinction that I'm making between a party and the GAL is that just because a GAL is appointed for a client of yours, you the attorney, GAL is appointed for a client, does not mean that you no longer have to or never speak to that person again. You take direction as to how you're going to settle a, a, a case, what ultimate um, witnesses kind of um, strategic action you're going to take in a case, but you can still talk to that person who remains at all times your client to get information. They're the party. They're the client. The GAL is sort of like the captain of the ship. Oh, does that help? Does that make sense? In, in, in a situation like you're describing, there are 50 other questions that we would have to ask. We would have to be very curious about that situation. And ultimately, you'd want to talk to about it with your supervisor. And I can tell you how I'm pretty sure it would end up in my firm, but I don't know how it would end up in your firm. Um, for, oh, can we do Lancaster first? Lancaster, what was your question? To me, so what this question was is um, there was a, a mom who was supposedly out there. The court didn't know where she was. Or did they have the mother in court? I think. Right, mother's in a different state. The court, but there's an aunt who helps take care of the mother. And the, the court asked the a ladle to reach out to the aunt to find out if the mother wanted representation. Am I getting that right? And at the same time, county kind of council is asking for a GAL. So again, these are the kinds of very, very difficult situations that come up. But our uh, friend of the court capacity um, is only to reach out to somebody who the court has reason to believe, has desires an attorney, and fits one of the categories, either legal guardianship of mother or father. 
um, a parent of some kind, um, a de facto parent, I think that's it. But perhaps and desires an attorney. So we don't we don't do investigations for the court. We are not an investigative arm of the court. <coughs> the, the the court would have to direct county council um, and the department to do something like that. If they wanted to hear from someone who is not a party in the case, they would have to go through the department. Because ultimately, we could end up being required to get up on the witness stand and testify to something that was done as an investigation, and we can't be put in that position. But in a somewhat similar case, and back to the actual GAL inquiries that we do, if, if in that case it was like someone clear that this person wanted an attorney, then you reach out to her and you need assistance from an aunt in obtaining the information you need, a lot of times that's what we suggest you do, that you talk to the client, you say, is there anyone else who I can speak with that I can help you with, to, without the appointment of an actual GAL, informally using her family members or service providers to assist you with that um, relationship to determine whether they understand the proceedings and if they're able to assist you. Ms. Perth? I just wanted to go back to say, in your situation, of, I feel that if you have a client as an attorney that can articulate they want their children back and they understand their children have been detained and they understand the court proceedings, that's the point when you start talking to that client and you may want to go before the judge and get the GAL removed. So I don't think you There's no way I would ever submit on a, on a request for TFR for a client who's able to tell me I want my child back. Yeah, that's the time when you may want to get rid of the GAL, because whatever has happened needs to change. And but again, I don't want to stop on anybody else's and can Yes, ma'am. Yes, really, please. Very quickly. When you're talking about the reaching out and stuff like that, also be aware because I once forced the judge to do this and he was furious, but you have to do it, which is sometimes you have people in lockup. They don't have to be out of state. They're in lockup and you have to, when you're out and talking to them, I had a client that was actively decompensating in lockup. I mean, really seriously hallucinating. There was no doubt that this person could not, they could not provide me with anything. So when I went back into the courtroom to say, Your Honor, I, I couldn't fill out paperwork, I couldn't do anything. And the court said, okay, I'm gonna appoint a GAL. And I said, no, Your Honor, you have to inquire of the client. And the judge was like, what do you mean? I don't, and the bailiff was saying, we couldn't get the person out of the lockup. They were gonna have a hard enough time getting the person into the bus. And I said, Your Honor, you're going to have to go into lockup. You have to ask the question. You cannot just make this decision. That's your responsibility. And this judge was furious and had to go with the court reporter into lockup and ask the questions because in that situation, I did not feel comfortable being a witness against my client. And I didn't want the judge to answer, ask me questions. Well, did you fill out the paper? Well, well I, no, 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 Your Honor. You know, move your butt into the <laughs> And with the court reporter, he did. And he made that determination. And then the GAO got appointed. So it's, you really do have to push this back on the judges sometimes because you really can't make, you can't provide that information at that point. Just final point to answer the question about GAL's powers versus duties. They're in our in our um, handout cheat sheet, but ultimately you're going to need to do a full investigation. If you're the GAL, do a full investigation. Assign a social work investigator if that's part of your office policy. And know that what the case law says is that you cannot relinquish a fundamental right of the client unless that is to their substantial benefit. So you cannot even settle a petition unless they're getting a substantial benefit out of this. So none of this settling petitions just to get the word recent stricken and, uh, you know, if FR is already granted, you probably should be careful about what you're doing if you're a GAL in making these decisions to give up fundamental rights for a client without being able to articulate what the significant benefit is to the client by waiting. Okay, so the other hypotheticals that we have, we'll be happy to play with those with you, anybody who wants to, but right now we have to go back to the law a little bit. <laughs> well. Well, I mean, on this hypothetical, I don't, sorry, Lancaster, no time to read it. I'll email it to you after. But essentially, a very interesting fact pattern. You're having difficulty talking with your client. You're able to finally get basic information from them. Is this client competent? 
Anybody Ms. Berger? Yes or no? This was Ms. Berger's case last week, I think. Oh, if it, then yes, she was <laughs> As long as when you ask her, do you know why you're here? And she says, Isabella, who's Isabella? I really hope yeah, that's if her Isabella kid. Really yeah. so, the yeah. kid Let's name. start with that. Yeah. But yes, if Isabella's the kid, she knows why she's here. And you've been able to talk to her and her parents and obtain that she wants her child back. And you filled out the paperwork. This should never require the appointment of a GAL. That's um, an example of the key. And... Once he says, no one is listening to me, he says, I don't want to talk to you five times, and then he says, no one is listening to me, again, that's your key. That's when you say, I'm, I'm here to listen to you. I'm sorry. I apologize to you for not listening to you. Um, I should never make you feel that way. Please, here, I've got my yellow pad. I'm going to write down all of your concerns. We're not going to, I'm not going to ask you any more questions until you've told me all your concerns. And you start writing them down, and like everybody knows who's heard me before, you know, it never takes more than a page, it never takes more than 20 minutes, and it often makes all the difference in the world because they've gotten their stuff out of there and now they're willing to communicate. And someone who looked catatonic or looked like they were completely refusing now is willing to cooperate. Our last hypothetical goes very much in line with um, the last slide, which is what about when you just can't, okay? So you're in a situation where a lot of people have asked me, your client deteriorates in the course of communication. If there really is, you've gone through everything. It's a difficult situation. It's not a Marsden situation. You've brought in a supervisor. That's not helping. You don't have any clear direction from the client to begin with. If you had some earlier in the case, you may be able to still proceed. Might be diff no different than a client going whereabouts unknown in the middle of a case. Um, are there family members, treatment team members, or others you can evolve? Have you tried all of the various techniques? Yellow pad, giving it time, none of this is working. Then you guys do have the option to file a motion to be relieved. You would look to rule um, 1.16 in declining or terminating representation. And I'm happy to give you the specifics of that um, if anybody wants to talk about it. This should be the rarest and most unused of um, results that we take in any case like this, but if it absolutely comes down to it and you cannot, without conflicting your duties of loyalty, confidentiality, and um, competency, continue to represent this client and you cannot ask for a GAL, you must withdraw. And then the process starts over, as our policy says, form that attorney-client relationship. If you can't, let the court know, GAL inquiry might, might go and then you're back where we started at the beginning of this. That's Just it. as one final, one final um, sentence would be, um, the, the, the notion that the that DCFS has, which is uh, we need to get guardian ad litems appointed to make everything easier, that is not something that we have signed on to. Ladle is anathema to that principle. We do not, we believe in representing our clients 100% all of the time. There is a model rule that is 1.14, which is um, we're trying to get it passed. We're trying to get it um, placed into our rules of professional conduct. But the truth is, last year when they approved all of the other rules, they did not approve the one about guardian ad litem. Um, the issue, this issue about when we do and don't um, substitute someone else's voice for our clients is a very thorny one and even at the Judicial Council they haven't been able to reach an agreement on it so we're still part of that conversation please bring us your interesting uh, guardian ad litem stories um, we collect them all because we'll be doing this training again in a year and a half and we will want to incorporate even new even more uh, hypotheticals and more of your experience thank you so much Yay.